Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Well, October 24th marks the diamond jubilee of the United Nations. But far from a joyous celebration, it is an occasion to somberly reflect on why the UN is stagnating at 75 and how it can regain its lost luster. Although much has changed in the international system since 1945, the world body continues to see a tussle between principle and power. On the one hand, the UN rep uh, represents hopes of a peaceful and just world order through multilateral cooperation, abidance by international law and upliftment of the downtrodden. On the other, the institution has been designed to privilege the most powerful states of the post-World War II dispensation by granting them commanding heights over international politics via the undemocratic institutions of veto power and permanent seats in the UN Security Council. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze 75 years of UN and what next for the world body. Joining me on the program today are Manjeev Singh Puri, former ambassador, Arvind Gupta, Director, Vivekananda International Foundation and uh, Professor Swaran Singh, Chairperson, Centre for International Politics, GNU. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Mr. Gupta, let me begin the programme with you first. How would you look back at 75 years of uh, the United Nations? I think the uh, report uh, given by the UN Secretary General uh, to this 75th session that uh, summarizes uh, the issue very well. So, on the one hand, uh, there are uh, some sterling achievements, like uh, avoiding the Third World War so far. He lists uh, some of these achievements. Uh, decolonization, fight against the apartheid, uh, maintaining peace uh, through numerous uh, peacekeeping missions, uh, uh, emphasizing the development taking uh, uh, development to many countries which otherwise wouldn't have got it. But at the same time, he also highlights the fragility uh, of uh, the United Nations system and the world today. And uh, the uh, risk of uh, a war has uh, not gone away. Uh, the security environment has deteriorated. The uh, peace, uh, the efforts for peace have uh, received a massive setback. Uh, today, uh, nuclear disarmament, for instance, uh, uh, is uh, almost a forgotten issue and uh, a new arms race uh, is uh, coming up. New technologies or the transformative technologies uh, present both uh, opportunities and uh, challenges. Inequality is growing. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity. So there are many, many uh, problems. And of course, uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, whether the United Nations and the, its uh, institutions, structures, procedures are really geared to meet these challenges, that I think is a big, big issue. Absolutely. Ambassador, let me bring you to the picture now. You know, you were in uh, New York for four years as India's representative uh, at the UN. You know, what did you see from the inside? What is it that stood out for you? What would you like to talk about? Frank, thank you very much. And I'm so glad that on 24th of October, you are actually focusing on multilateralism. In my opinion, you know, first point I'd like to make is we should be very clear in our mind that the United Nations is about global governance. It is not global government. So it is we who are responsible. And of course, as you very rightly put it, the we is a stratified we. There is the general membership and there are five who are specially enabled. This was the outcome of World War II, and it happened at that stage. Now, I think the biggest problem with the United Nations is that it has not been able to with globalization, especially the last 20, 25 years, where there has been a greater flood in the global economic scene. Countries like India have come to the fore. We've become the fifth largest economy in the world. And along with us, many other countries uh, have come there. Plus, you have the old have-nots from World War II times, Germany and Japan, not being given a due recognition in this particular thing. The United Nations, as uh, Professor Arvind Gupta pointed out, has done and served us well. But it has served us well in its construct, 
for particular purposes, no World War III, certain basics in terms of development. But as the world adjusts, it also needs to adjust. And it is really being a laggard. It's being slow. And we, in, indeed, when the Honorable Prime Minister spoke, he also mentioned that the most important thing is you should change. He voiced a certain amount of frustration, which is very important to do. But this particular thing, I think, which is important, I'll stop by simply saying the multilateralism is critically important, particularly in the context of things that we see today, uh, whether it is new technologies, artificial intelligence, climate change or pandemics. You need de jure action. You need commitment of everyone, everyone to be on board. But you also need to see to it that the polarity which works around the United Nations to really give it the muscle is made a larger and more multipolar so that you can harness everybody in just the people who were there at the end of World War II are not sufficient today. And that's perhaps the most important thing, which is the United Nations. Therefore, it's not just that because of COVID, the General Assembly was merely a video screening, but it's cause for introspection. And I hope the introspection results in reform because this is an organization, this is a system of global governance that gives everybody a certain amount of stake and allows those who have the greatest capabilities to be able to really take things forward for the benefit of everyone, including themselves. Absolutely. Professor, let me bring you into the picture now. So since 1945 to 2020, how has the UN evolved? This could always be seen as a case uh, of half glass full. Uh, but I think it's a matter of great satisfaction that an organization which is as large as the entire global uh, group of nations has survived uh, all these uh, 75 years uh, compared to League of Nations. Uh, so I think the very sustenance of organization, uh, which is pulled in all directions by different members, uh, itself is an achievement. Now, I think it's also important to understand that the very formulation of the Charter of United Nations happened in the backdrop of two world wars. So, saving future generations from scourge of war, as the Charter says, was the main aim of setting up of an organization of this nature and scale. And as Ambassador Arvind Gupta just said, uh, we have not had World War III so far. But remember, it was very pious and very ambitious charter. So it also spoke of eliminating that war from the minds of men. Now, that part perhaps we have not been able to achieve so far because both violence, arms race and wars have continued to happen. So what we are seeing here is how you opened your program, this constant effort between principles and power. Or let me be more precise to say how major powers largely, if not dominating, controlling functioning of United Nations have been forced repeatedly to work within described and agreed upon principles. And I think to that extent, it's a matter of satisfaction. Second, it's not that in 75 years, United Nations has not improvised itself. You remember in decade of 1960s, when whole decolonization happened, and the membership doubled within a matter of five, seven years from 50 to 100 plus all organizations of Economic and Social Council, but also UN Security Council membership expanded. So in that sense, UN peacekeeping started. These are all improvisations. And I think peacekeeping is an area where India's visibility contribution has given us enormous opportunities to influence the discourse and implement some of these peacekeeping operations. Yes, lot can be achieved and we still think lot not, not more need to be done, particularly this post-Cold War world 45 or 40 years of discussion of further expanding UN Security, Security Council remains up front and that challenge has not been addressed even, uh, forget resolving it. So I think there is a certain amount of satisfaction on the fact that organization has continued to thrive. There is no parallel organization that we have so we must sustain this and strengthen it, of course, but challenges are always there. And since India is going to sit on Security Council from 1st of January next year as non-permanent member, India will be sitting on that apex body and maybe could help accelerate the process of how to reform 
so that UN Security Council bodies become representative of the 21st century global order and global world, and begins to focus much more on principles rather than power, and move from emerging as an international government to focusing on global governance issues. The inclusion of civil society, I think, is another very important improvisation that has happened over a period of time. So UN is not simply an organization of nations anymore. If you see how United Nations organs and bodies and agencies today engage directly people within nations, the civil society, experts, intellectuals, media, NGOs. So certain amount of improvisation definitely has happened, which explains its survival so far. But a lot more need to be done. There is no doubt on it. Okay. On this issue, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, Mr. Gupta, of course, the United Nations has done a great deal over the last 75 years. But do you believe that, you know, how do we better it? What more needs to be done? And, uh, you know, what should be done in the immediate near future? What should be the long-term goals? And also, just to look at it from a different perspective, the UN in its present sense, has, its, has it outlived its utility? Well, I think that's a good question. And uh, uh, there is no uh, easy answer to that uh, question. Uh, surely, uh, the challenges of the 21st century are uh, very different from that of uh, the uh, mid 20th century. And uh, I think uh, the key issue here is, and what you also underlined, and uh, Professor Swaran Singh also underlined, what is the emphasis on power that the United Nations is going to give or the world is going to give? Unless we de-emphasize power, I know it uh, sounds utopian, but that is where the problem is. So power and principle, if it is always the power, and if the principle is to be written by the most powerful, then I think you will have more of the same. So that is where the uh, issue is. And here I think uh, India can certainly uh, take a lead. And that is uh, simply because we have uh, a 5,000 years old history. Uh, we are a civilization with strong civilizational attributes, which emphasizes, as the Prime Minister has said many times, world is a family. Uh, as uh, many of our uh, uh, Vivekananda, for instance, uh, said, uh, or uh, our scriptures say, that we see divinity in everything. Now, these are the principles which, of course, is seen in a narrow context, probably will be misunderstood. But if we can use these principles and give them a 21st century vocabulary and use them to come out with at least some additionalities to the charter, I think that is where uh, then probably we'll make some uh, uh, headway. And I think there is another very important uh, missing uh, 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 link in this, and which is the charter talks about rights, but it doesn't talk about responsibilities and duties. Whereas in our thinking, uh, duties and responsibilities, which is really the dharma, is extremely important. Now, how do we square uh, the responsibilities and duties with rights and reach a, a balance. I think unless we bring these into uh, our multilateral uh, thinking and new multilateralism and reformed multilateralism, we will not make much of the headway. Of course, uh, uh, we can have many summits, as many as we like, but they will not uh, achieve uh, very much. Absolutely. All right. So, Ambassador, uh, let's talk about strengthening the UN then. What needs to be done so that we can see a stronger UN? Do we need to break away from the original charter, try and, uh, you know, draft something new, try, try and see and, uh, you know, uh, open-minded principles, rules, regulations, guidelines and everything for that matter? I, I think I want, you know, we are talking about not moral organizations, but governance organizations. And power is at the center of it. In 1945, they thought five people would be sufficient to provide a fulcrum. In 2008, when we had the global economic crisis, the world thought, no, we need more. We needed 20. How many do we need? I don't know the answers. But it certainly is clear that five is not sufficient. What the five could do, they did manage. No World War Three. But in terms of a much better quality of life in a globalized world where the advantage of technology gets flattened out within a few years, 
that's a different matter altogether and we must address it what i'm very happy with is that everyone agrees that you need multilateralism if you need multilateralism we can call it the united nations we can call it whatever else but basically we are talking about global governance and we are talking about an organization which in my view is best suited if it can get participation by all harness the power and the abilities of as many who are there so that we can contribute to global good to my mind the most important measure of change which is required is one of a change in its very fundamental governance structure you know there are many things we can talk about you should have a specialized agency to look at artificial intelligence or it or we can have a new convention on how we should manage uh, the issues relating to it or pandemics etc all of these are true and many such things are the issues of today many more will come about in tomorrow but fundamentally we should understand that it is institutional structures it is the those who sit in the key of the governing place it is they who can push things forward and you can have meaningful discussions on food on health on artificial intelligence on technology and several things and which is why i believe critical is that at at least two major sets of intergovernmental organization the united nations itself and at the bretton woods institution there is need for key governance reform at the un the security council must be expanded in terms of its core members and we are talking about permanent membership we are certainly one of the main contenders it's a very long drawn out process and i understand that many in india tend to feel that you know where is it going but demand yours need to be persevering you ka you should express frustration but not be frustrated you should persevere because change and especially to say no is very easy but to bring about change is very difficult but my own understanding is that the haves of the world would be benefited by bringing about the change because otherwise the institution in which they are the haves itself will come into question which it increasingly is similar lies the case with the bretton woods institution with their great global abilities to be in, able to influence the way the global economy moves after that comes all the specialized agencies whether it's who so i remain very convinced that global governance is important as we move for with greater technological access it will become much more important but we need to have a greater flattening of the governance structure and certainly harness the abilities of many more other than just the five who are capable of contributing to global good absolutely reform is what is required really as far as the unsc is concerned india needs to get uh, a permanent seat on the unsc is what you're suggesting so professor let me bring you into the picture now i think this is a very valid point that the ambassador has just made about how we need to persevere really and many people question this fact about nothing is going to change so why should india keep talking about a permanent seat at the unsc but the simple example to give is that you know you don't uh, cut down a tree with one blow of the axe you continuously keep striking it down with the axe and only then will the tree finally or eventually fall it is probably the same kind of analogy that we need to use for the permanent five excellent i think frank you have uh, you know really described it very well by saying that you can't fell a tree with one one stroke so incrementally things have to change but let me preface my remark by first saying you know any international or regional organization cannot survive cannot thrive cannot deliver if it begins to hurt the core interests of powerful members now that is the basis of creation of veto but i agree with ambassador puri things have changed just those five are no longer influencing the global governance global trends now there are many more other nations and they are being gradually recognized even in bretton woods institutions the voting weightage has evolved over a period of time not only the g7 has become g20 now india during 1990s was under certain stress because of this whole collapse of soviet union which was a very close ally of india and the whole uh, the defaulting of uh, foreign payments the debt crisis internal politics moving to coalition uh, you know crisis and difficulties in punjab and kashmir beginning at that time 
But from 1990s, when India was contributing, I think about 0.3%, 0.3% the UN uh, annual budget, we are today almost hitting 1% of UN budget. So the core contribution of India to the very functioning of the organization has changed over a period of time. And that is why India is much more visible and engaged in influencing discourses. I think the fact that UN has already set up a working group on India's proposal to create a convention on countering international terrorism. International terrorism is the core problem that UN organization is facing. It's a global threat and UN has to deal with that. And compare it to Rajiv Gandhi's 1988 plan, which over some 30 years was supposed to eliminate all nuclear weapons, which was not cared upon. Nobody listened to that. Very ambitious project, very ambitious program, but nothing happened of it. But compared to that now, the new focus that India has on creating a convention on countering international terrorism, there is a certain momentum in United Nations. And I think as India joins next year on the UN Security Council, maybe things will change. Currently, because of pandemic, the other organization which is related to United Nations World Health Organization, I think enormous initiative and activism will be required also not only to deal with pandemic, but also undertake transformation of WHO. India again is luckily for next three years is sitting as chair of the World Health Assembly. So India is recognized and given certain responsibilities. The simple fact that India received 184 votes to be elected to uh, as a non-permanent member this, this time in UN Security Council out of 193 members. Look at what is happening to China. In the Human Rights Council, India lost, uh, China lost 41 votes. In 2016, it was brought into Human Rights Council with, I think, about 187 votes. Now, it is the lowest member with lowest votes to be added to UN Human Rights Council with 139 votes. So this larger expression of where the world wants United Nations to go, where the world wants the main actors to be either upgraded or downgraded, is always visible in these incremental changes in United Nations. And right. India is definitely becoming a much more acceptable player to play an important role and give a direction to UN. And I think that we'll see that India's vision will also gradually get implemented in incremental changes. No quick changes, but incremental changes which will happen in United Nations coming times. And those incremental changes have continued in the last 75 years. We need to decide what are the new incremental changes we need to move. And mm. dealing with terrorism is one of them where India has a leading role. Absolutely. All right. Time to get quick closing comments now from all my panelists with the best way forward. Starting first with you, Mr. Gupta. Yes, best way forward certainly is uh, to uh, look at uh, the institutions and structures of the uh, UN and uh, really uh, look at this reformed multilateralism which Prime Minister has talked about and see what are the principles which would uh, guide uh, uh, this exercise. But I think we should keep our minds open and unless we uh, reduce the salience of power to some extent, uh, I think we would be creating the same kind of uh, unequal, iniquitous uh, structures uh, uh, like before. So it is necessary that India could perhaps uh, start a dialogue with like-minded countries, even on the, kind, uh, the principles of the reformed multilateralism, which are broadly acceptable and which go beyond simply by what the uh, P5 or the most powerful countries say. Absolutely. Ambassador? Frank? We have a fortuitous set of circumstances. India will serve on the Security Council for two years starting from January 2021. We are also joining the Troika of the G20 and will host the G20 summit in India in 2022. The BRICS summit is also going to be held here. When you look at all these particular fortuitous circumstances, I believe what we need to do is to engage strongly and I was very glad that the Honorable Prime Minister strongly spoke about the need for reform when he addressed the United Nations General Assembly on two occasions. Mm. The celebratory one for the 75th anniversary as well as the main annual session of the G. We should remain strongly engaged in this process. Talk to those who really matter. This is not just the other, the P5 members, but other major countries in the world, of course, apart from the globe. And we must try and push forward institutional reform. 
And I completely agree with Professor Swan Singh. You should also try and find the way forward for issues which are germane to your interests, like international terrorism. This is the opportunity. Opportunities need to be taken, and we happen to have a set of circumstances which should be worked upon. So strong right. engagement with multilateralism is what I would advise. Absolutely. And Professor, close the show for us with your quick concluding remark. Thank you. Like any other organization, United Nations will continue to be shaped by power equations of major stakeholders or members. Now, two things can be done. One, what elements of that power are allowed to be appreciated over a period of time? Is it crude military power or is it soft power, economic power, which need to be really front-loaded and appreciated? Second, how can members together make sure that these great powers who play a almost controlling role in United Nations very often are forced upon to keep working within those frameworks of principles. So the balance between power and principles has to be maintained. And for me, India's visibility and influence in United Nations is without doubt rising. And India is really weighing with the principles rather than power. And I think that kind of tilting of India will mm. really help improve improve United Nations in coming times. Right. Okay. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that the UN has indeed survived and thrived and also seen incremental changes over the last 75 years. Uh, but it has also ensured that it has stopped a World War III from taking place, but the time has come once again for it to change and change for the better. The UNSC is uh, in desperate re need for reform. The sooner that the reform takes place, the better for the organization. If it does not reform, it you know, stands to be redundant, is what the panelists are suggesting. Let's also remember that uh, the principles are written by the most powerful and the principles are going to be skewed if they are written that way. So that too needs to change going forward. So what we need is complete reform as far as the UN is concerned. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time.